Colossians chapter 2. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. I believe that these are gifts that Paul talks about as benefits to being a follower of Jesus. I love the life I get to live. And I pray the same for you. And as Paul writes the book of Colossians, I believe he has this mindset that he wants to get across to the believers in Colossae as he's sitting in the jail cell waiting for the end of his life, basically, but yet still finding reasons to believe in Jesus. We're going to begin reading in verse 6. The title of this section is Freedom from Human Regulations Through Life with Christ. This is ultimately what we're talking about when we have this question that we talked about this last week. What, and in the point of being a follower of Jesus is then what, Pastor? Life with Christ. We've just listed off in our own hearts the benefits that we each individually find in being a follower of Jesus. Verse 6 starts with this. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthen in faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than of, on Christ. For in Christ, all fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head and over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision due, done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the, in, in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with his regulations that was against us, that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. Let's pray. Father God, as we continue in this conversation around Colossians, I thank you for this book. I thank you for the freedom we have in Christ. And God, I thank you for all the benefits that come with that. God, there is ultimately a benefit and a hope and assurance of eternal life with you, Father. But here on earth, we still live. And God, the benefits that we receive from receiving your Son are endless. God, but as human beings, we forget. So in this moment, continue to remind us and allow us to be thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 6 to 7 talks about this idea of receiving Christ as your Savior and being rooted in Him, strengthened in faith in Him, and then the conversation swings to a religious mindset. I've talked about the idea in my own life that to those that I interact with, I want to continually try to be the least religious person people know. The comment saying, Brian, you must be a religious person. Well, verse 8 to 9 talks about the idea of not being dragged away by religion. 
Because Christianity really is a religion of it all being done for us. And not an not a idea of having to do and do and do. But we as human beings default to the idea that if I receive something, I'm ultimately expected to pay it back, right? Don't be dragged away by this thought, Paul says. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. In life, I believe there's three types of people. We're actually going to bring this up, Grace. These are the three types of people. That is slide number five I was talking about. These three types of people. I believe there's people who are saved through faith. Verse 12 talks about this idea that having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your life, this is the idea that there's a, and, and really stats show that there's a third of people in humanity that have this faith. There are those that are saved. And then we talked about this people that have no knowledge of Christ for two reasons, particularly they've not heard about Jesus or the real Jesus. Or they've been hurt by religion. We talked about this last week. The people that have no knowledge of Jesus. And then there's those that have rejected. And they have religion without Christ. That, I believe, is what Paul is really talking to. If we go to the next slide, Grace, I I really want to go to the idea that Colossians is written to the first group of people on the left well, I guess on your right. This is the people that Paul is writing to. The rejected people are the people that Paul is writing against or about. Try to avoid this. And then the middle group of people, I've thought about this this week a lot. I am sure during Paul's time, Paul wrote some really good letters to some really good people who didn't have a faith in Jesus. And because they read these letters, they came to an impacted level of faith in Jesus, and they became the saved. Man, I wish I had these letters. These letters don't exist. Maybe they did. Today we might call them tracts or daily breads. I don't know what you might call them, but I really want to understand what it means to come to a resurrected faith in Jesus in Paul's time. So let's look at the first two groups of people. When Paul is writing to Colossians, he's speaking to the saved, warning them against group one, and encouraging them to experience the revelation of Christ. So first I want to ask this question. Does God want us to figure it all out? The question of the day is, does God want us to figure it all out? Because what I think happens is, as we try to figure it all out, we slip from the saved, potentially, into the religious. The further you go to understanding who God is, Potentially, the further you slip into a religious mindset. Or another question could be, or what do I have to do to get to heaven? Because ultimately, that's what religious people end up doing. They realize there are things I have to do to get to heaven. Or another question could be, or what do I have to do to earn salvation? Which leads ultimately to the question, how do I avoid eternity, or hell. I want that letter that Paul wrote to the people in the middle. Because I believe maybe that might answer some of these questions. I want that letter that Paul wrote to the people before Colossians. In our family, we have had and still have Pets. Currently, we have a dog. His name is Caesar. 
He obeys really well most times. Very good dog, possibly one of our better dogs that we've ever had. But he doesn't always listen, particularly when he sees a squirrel and wants to chase after other animals. He is not confined too much in our backyard. We have a fenced-in area that he gets to roam around, but from time to time he sees something beyond the fence and he wants to break away. And then we have Myrtle the turtle. I've got a couple pictures of Myrtle up on the screen. Um, Myrtle is a red-eared slider turtle. We're in the process, if you feel called at one point during this message, to adopt a pet turtle. Um, We're considering, uh, at one point, allowing Myrtle to find a new home. We've had him for uh, the last 10 years, and Myrtle is about 17 years old, in the, in the, around the same, uh, maybe 15 years old, and Myrtle lives in this aquarium. Unlike Caesar, he can't escape the aquarium, uh, and you know, when he does get out of the aquarium when we're cleaning him, he likes to peruse the house as much as possible. I remember particularly one phone call we got from Bree, when she was cleaning the turtle, she uh, called us and said, Myrtle jumped off of, or, well, Myrtle was on the floor on the first level. He lives on the second level. We're not sure how he ended up down on the first level, whether he decided at one point to jump to his uh, um, eternity, but his shell saved him. We're not sure. But Myrtle lives a life that I want to correlate to ours as human beings for a second. When he sees me walk up to the tank, he gets excited because he knows there's only one reason I'm walking up to the tank, and that's to feed, to provide for him. He gets overly excited. He is like swimming back and forth because Myrtle's usually a turtle in a tank. That's what Myrtle is. When I show up, he gets excited. But the turtle can't do anything to earn the food. Unlike Caesar, I could say, you know, paw Caesar, and Caesar will do the trick and put his paw on my lap, and I would feed Caesar based on some tricks that he would be able to do. Myrtle can't do anything. In fact, if I reach in to grab Turtle, the Myrtle, the turtle, he will hiss at me in anger. Like, he will get mad at me if I try to interact with him at all. He will hiss, and he's cranky. But yet I still feed him. I still provide for him. And no matter how disobedient I think turtle, the Myrtle the Turtle might be, I continue to provide for him. There's days where Myrtle might not receive food. We might forget about Myrtle from time to time. And I'm sure he sits in his little turtle tank wondering where his human God is, the person that provides for him at all times. Isn't that much like the way we live our lives? Myrtle has this faith that, yes, that person is going to show up and he's going to drop these little pellets and at some point provide for me. He has this pistis type of faith that that man will provide or that woman will provide or whoever that person that drops those things into my tank will provide. Hopeless it seems to be. There's this paralyzed man that Jesus interacts with in Mark chapter 2. Jesus is teaching in this house, and all of a sudden, in the blue, there's rubble that's falling down from the ceiling. And this rubble turns into a greater hole, and from that hole, there's four friends that are dropping this paralyzed man into the, into the feet of Jesus, in front of Jesus. Hopeless. But the four friends have this same pistis mindset, this faith that Jesus can heal him. 
And Jesus remarks to this man and the four that drop him or lower him down in front of him. He says, your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. Now I'm sure all the way up to that point, they thought through, before they even knew Jesus, several ways potentially for their friend to be healed. They probably prayed religiously. They probably went to the pool of shalom. They probably did all of these religious things that would bring this man to to healing. They tried to figure it out. And that's what we do as human beings. And that's, in, in the end, what religion is. Religion is us as human beings trying to figure it out. That's the ology part of theology. We're trying to figure it out. And that's what science tries to do. Psychology, sociology, all of the ologies are trying to figure it out. I remember in school one time there was this equation up on the board and just a massive amount of just numbers and letters. I'm not a smart man. But as those numbers began to whittle down, as, as, as the teacher was beginning to, to dissect this equation, he came in, in the board potentially kind of looked like this. And it all whittled down to these three letters and a number. An equation that many of us are familiar with. E equals MC squared, a fundamental equation that has profound impact on our understanding of the physical world. It has practical applications in various scientific and technological fields and has led to advancements in nuclear physics, astrophysics, and the development of technologies that affect our daily lives. And it had to be figured out. And Einstein's the one that figured it out. We do have a religious E equals MC squared in Christianity. And we've tried to boil it down to this Christian equation. Accept Jesus as personal Savior and say the sinner's prayer. Repent and try not to lose your salvation. The Christian equation. And ultimately, when we boil it down to an equation like that, I am sure our Father is in heaven is going, whoa, wait a minute. It's not an equation, it's a relationship. Salvation is not trying to figure it out. It's releasing yourself and receiving me. Let's go back to verse 6 for a second. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord... It doesn't say you figured it all out. You became a follower of mine and now continue to figure me out a little bit more every day. No, Paul says, continue to live in Jesus. Salvation is about believing and receiving squared, continuing to do it over and over. Believe every day, wake up. The little practice we had during the song, Gratitude. My prayer is that you didn't leave it empty. If you did, I'm sure you thought of some things that made you thankful to be a follower of Jesus. And really, that's what faith is. Waking up every morning, believing and receiving squared. Salvation equals Believing and receiving every day. Knowing by faith that your God will provide. And not necessarily having to do anything to to, 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 to earn it. Myrtle the turtle doesn't do anything to earn his food. But he has faith that there is someone that's going to show up, drop some food in and provide for the day. I don't know what his prayer is. It's like our father type of prayer, you know. You know, maybe that little turtle is like, you know, that person that drops the food off every day, can you show up again today, please? Whatever it is. That's a turtle-like faith. 
I want that kind of faith. The faith just believes. There is a massive benefit to that type of faith. A faith that doesn't have to do anything to receive anything. A faith that just receives a gift from Christ and lives for him. I want that type of faith. Go back to the question. Does God want us to figure it out? I don't think so. I think he just wants to live, us to live by faith. What are the benefits? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Look at your sheet right now. What are the benefits to having that faith? One of the benefits is getting to serve. Being a loving person is a benefit. Being a joyful person is a benefit. Being a peaceful person is a benefit. Being a patient person is a benefit. Kind, faithful, self-controlled. As a church, we have the benefit here at 383 Hampton Road of living that type of life, a life that is, has, displays those benefits. And one of the ways we love to do that through our six missions is, is through Outflow. And January is our month where we really focus in on Outflow. I'm looking forward to coldest night of the year again in February and begin to think through those opportunities. And today after church, I really want you to begin to think through how as a uh, as a, a member or attendee of KBC, you can participate in Outflow this year. My desire is that everybody at one point through the year attends an Outflow meal. Next Sunday is our first one of the year, and um, we have an opportunity to provide sandwiches for those at Outflow. And so at the back in the corner by our missions wall is an opportunity for supplies for the actual sandwiches for this weekend. And then on the right-hand column, Sharon's going to be back there. I want you to Take one of the 12 dates and mark it in your calendar and say, I'm going to provide and help with outflow for that particular month, uh, month of, the, of the year. So please, if you have a chance, practice the benefit of being a follower of Jesus with the opportunity to serve at outflow. So at the back of the sanctuary, Sharon will be back there today. And if you as a small group, you guys have always done it, just pick the date. By the end of this week, I would really like to have all of those dates filled in, and that would be great. We're not trying to figure it out. We're just trying to live with the benefit of being a follower of Jesus. I'm going to invite the worship team back up, and we're going to continue in a time of worship, another benefit of being a follower of Jesus. There are endless benefits. To being a follower of Jesus. Maybe you've listed seven today. I want you to go home and continue to think about that. Waking up every day, believing and receiving the message of Christ.